Hello, my name is Arlene Gorelick, and I'm the president of the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan. And I would like to introduce you to this panel presentation from our recent Wellness and Epilepsy Conference entitled, Fostering Emotional Well-Being in Children with Epilepsy. We have today three panelists who are going to share their views. Eric Herman has worked as a psychologist at Children's Hospital of Michigan since 2005 and has been in private practice since 2003. He works giving therapy to children with chronic disease and various psychiatric disorders. Kathleen Pollock is a certified pediatric nurse practitioner at Children's Hospital of Michigan. In addition to epilepsy, her clinical interests include tuberous sclerosis and child development. Susan Beery is, lives in Hudsonville, Michigan, and is the mother of two children, Alex and Nicholas. Alex was diagnosed with epilepsy at 18 months. She has had two surgeries for her epilepsy and is a former winning kid. The panel will be moderated by Linda Fletcher. Linda is a certified pediatric nurse practitioner and is the project coordinator of the Pediatric Epilepsy Telemedicine Project. We hope that the information here will be useful to you. And please remember, the Epilepsy Foundation of Michigan is here for you. This session is sponsored by Children's Hospital of Michigan. Good afternoon, everybody. After that delicious lunch, we'll get started. What I'm going to ask, I know Arlene did a brief introduction for each panelist, but I'm going to ask them each to, to begin with a brief overview of their experience with childhood epilepsy, um, how, how they see it affecting the child's social and emotional well-being, and what they each see as the greatest challenge in helping parents and children cope with epilepsy. And we'll start with that and maybe start with Susan. As Arlene said, um, our daughter, she's now 14. She had her first seizure at seven months and took a, a while to get the diagnosis at 18 months. And the journey for her has just been, um, where is she right now? Just understanding what her needs are because they have changed over time, uh, partly due to medications, her seizure status. Um, again, she's now post-surgery and so we're dealing with a, a whole host of things that we hope are just gonna be temporary get her back to where she was before, if not better. And on the, the social and emotional side, it's just really understanding who she is underneath all of this other stuff, that if it wasn't there, what does Alex enjoy doing? Um, how is she um, most happy in her life? And that's, as her parents, we're trying to accommodate those things as well as paying attention to the school, because that's important too. Thank you, Susan. My experience at the hospital is with kids that have various health conditions. Um, but a, the thing that strikes me the most about epilepsy is the unpredictability of uh, the seizures. And I think that's what makes this such a hard problem to deal with, that things can go so well for so long, and then a seizure, or a, a couple seizures can put somebody off track. So that's what, um, you know, when I, work with families with kids with epilepsy, uh, kids that have seizures. We try to uh, take that into account and then try to help them get quickly back on track as fast as possible. Kathy? Okay. Well, I've worked at Children's itself a very long time and worked with the, in the inpatient setting, so had an opportunity to work with families when their kids were very ill and having seizures and hospitalized. But for the last uh, about 11 years, I've been working through the clinic, which is a very different perspective than taking care of kids in the hospital. And I, really, and I work in the clinic, you know, seeing kids in the clinic, and also talking to people on the phone and answering emails, too. We, we multi-communicate these days, which is really nice. But I see my role as one of helping the family or working through the parents to um, be able to help their child grow and develop and learn in the, as they deal with the diagnosis of epilepsy and the reality of what epilepsy is. So I work mostly with parents um, and help them learn how to take care of their kids, so. Okay, thank you. The, the, next, the next thing I'd like to ask you all to respond to is the diagnosis of epilepsy brings with it a number of concerns. 
and how do you how do you help the families? How do you um, deal with 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 the diagnosis from the time the diagnosis is made? And is it possible for us um, as parents, as healthcare providers, to help the family come to terms with the the child, the youth, the family come to terms with the diagnosis over time? As I said, it's it's changed over time. Um, some of the earlier discussions today talked about when you have a small child and things are just a little bit simpler then. We had uh, great comfort in our school system knowing she was always in a safe, nurturing environment. She knew and felt that those people cared for her. That was good. I mean, we, we were um, grateful for that as well as all of the input that they gave her in a cognitively impaired program. Kept her on track the best that they could despite what else was going on and again, she, the attention, the sleepiness, the seizure. She had to nap at school. She may have come back out of it that day and got something, a um, lot of lost days. Um, but now as she's transitioned to middle school, um, there's more um, independence, obviously. And for parents who have been there and done that transition, we don't see what goes on in, in middle school classrooms. Parents literally are not there as much as we are in elementary. It's just a huge change, takes a while to get used to. But at the same time, we've talked already today about the communication. And you have to learn to trust the teachers um, and let them know that they can trust you as well. If you're going to say something, you're going to follow through on it and do it. Um, and we've taken the approach of, yes, our daughter needs different things. And it's, uh, we, we try and talk with Alex, too, about fairness so she doesn't feel badly about herself that she has to do things differently than others, we say this is what's fair because it's what you need. It's not about treating you exactly the same as everybody else. You, this is what you need to be successful. And they do that for everybody, Alex. It's not just you. Um, but then also telling the, the staff that we want to help them do their job very well to, to motivate them that way because they do care about the kids. And Alex can still sense that, but it is a little bit... Um, She's socially, she, we'll get to that in a little bit, but um, she has felt different all about, all through. And kids can't help but feel different, they know. Adults do too, but kids probably process it differently. So we've tried to talk to her in those terms. Yes, you are different, it's just a small part of who you are. Um, and just continue to tell her you can do your very best and that's all that we expect. Um. You know, coming to terms with a very serious illness uh, is uh, a difficult process. Nobody wants to have a sick child. Um, so th what I would say to that at first is there's a lot of work that goes in with um, coming to terms with it. It's different for parents. It's different for their children. Um, and I think it's a constant coming to terms with it because like I said, it's unpredictable. You can do well for a while, uh, get your hopes up that things are going good, think that the goals that you have for your child are appropriate, and then you can have setbacks. So it's a constant coming to terms with it. But I think there's no choice. I think for the kids to have the lives that they can have or the best of lives as they can have, people have to come to terms with it and they have to do everything they can to uh, live as normal of a life as possible. Um, what, what I see when I work with parents um, when their children is, are first diagnosed with seizures or epilepsy, first, first of all, sometimes it's, is this a seizure? And so there's that whole process and then coming to a realization that this is seizures and this is epilepsy, um, is that this is very much a process, that there's so many unknowns in the beginning. You don't know whether they're going to have another seizure or not, what caused the seizures, what's going to be the unknown, the long-term outcome, and then that one question that parents never ask us, is, is my child going to die during a seizure? I mean, people don't ask that outright. We need to, as providers, need to sort of bring that up and allay that fear. What people know about epilepsy uh, is when they start the journey is what's in the media, which is all many myths and misconceptions about what epilepsy is, what a seizure is, what you do during a seizure, all of that. So I see education as one of the key components in the beginning of that journey is to help families understand what epilepsy is, the reality of it, that, you know, um, and we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about the fear part of it, that, um, you know, people don't generally die during a seizure. So, you know, these are, these are not 
as dangerous as sometimes people think they are by uh, seeing media depictions of them. So good education, really understand what's going on. And then there's concept of the unknown, so things that you can find an answer to if you look hard enough. But then there are unknowable things that nobody has the answer to. There are, there's not an answer. We can't look at a, an eight-month-old baby and tell you what they're going to look like when they're 20 or 30. So those are unknown things. You know? So you have to be able to separate those out, be able to accept that there is some unknowable stuff about this disease and this process. Take care of what you, figuring out what you can know, and then sort of start on that journey from there. Um, um, but I really think you need to think of it as a process and a journey. Um, and understanding epilepsy and, and seizures, I think, is very important and key. Well, and I think the, that follows Kathy nicely with it. The next topic that we want to discuss is about stress and anxiety. And I guess I would or maybe start with you, Kathy, in terms of our, your comments seem to be directed in that way that you feel that, that education is a way to decrease the stress and anxiety? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, know, and knowing, having a plan. What are we going to do? You know, having that action plan, your seizure action plan. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do when the child has this, another seizure um, so that you have, feel like you have some control over it? Um, having a good re working relationship with your provider so that you feel like you're in this together and that you communicate well back and forth. You, you have as good as you can possibly get control of the seizure so that you're talking back and forth and know, uh, you're letting the provider know what's not working and you can c adapt the plan so that it does work. Um, I think that gives you some sense of control and therefore decreases the anxiety that can go on with that. And the kids get the anxiety from the parents. I mean, kids aren't, I mean, in, especially young children, they don't really know quite what it is that's going on. So they pick up these feelings of stress and anxiety from the parents. So if you can control, the parent can control their own stress and anxiety, that's going to go a long ways to helping the child be less stressed and anxious. Thanks, Kathy. Great comments here. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, in terms of psychologically, um, the anxiety is the, is the main psychiatric symptom that I would deal with related to epilepsy. It's anxiety and then it's depression and or other behavioral problems, usually for younger children. Um, because of the unpredictable nature of the seizures, I th think that goes hand in hand with anxiety. When we think about anxiety, it's always about what's going to happen and if we don't know, that provokes anxiety. So there's lots of anticipation. So you'll hear from kids, what if I get sick? What if I'm far from home? What if the people around me don't know? And, I, and that's exactly what the parents are most afraid of. Um, anxiety is contagious. So I think the point of kids feeding off of parents, if, if, the, if the kids look at the parents and see fear, um, they'll think there's something to be afraid of. Um, in terms of the anxiety, I think the idea of having a plan to know what uh, to do in case you're away from home, uh, small things just like having a medical uh, bracelet, um, making sure the people around your children know that they have this condition and what to do. Um, I think these are all things that can help people to feel more secure when they're trying to lead uh, a normal life. Thank you. Well, and as a parent, that is um, a learned thing to control our anxiety because it, it can be um, unpredictable, not how you planned a, a particular day or a particular trip. And there were times when we didn't do so well with that, but fortunately, Alex was younger. And we did learn then that, of course, you approach it in a rational way now, but you also have to do it in a way to motivate them that hey, it's no big deal. You know, you just had a seizure. I'm going to email school. You're going to get on the bus in five minutes because you look perfectly <laughs> fine to me. And she will be a little bit groggy, but teachers know to look for that. And it, if you frame it that way and you're just consistent with it, um, kids can try and manipulate a little bit. We fortunately have a daughter who isn't very anxious and hasn't ever tried to use it to her advantage extensively, but we've had to head it off a couple of times. And parents do definitely, it's a learning curve. Don't be so hard on yourselves, you'll get there. You know, and I, I think there's, you know, the way I think about it, there's two sets of problems. There's the parents that are 
anxious and they're overdoing it, so they're trying to control even things that they can't control to make sure their children are safe. And then there's an underdoing it component where parents will let kids off the hook because they have a condition and they feel guilty about it and they, they feel sorry for the child and they don't hold them responsible behaviorally. You know, what if this behavior is related to a seizure um, and therefore I don't want to um, punish somebody or hold them accountable because it wasn't their fault. So it's this combination of overdoing it and underdoing it. It's hard to get right. You know, it, it's a very difficult situation and I'm sure it takes a lot of practice to know exactly what to do, um, but something in the middle. And would you say that's related to the fear that that was our next point that we wanted to discuss was it, is that how does that relate to the fear that the, the child may have about having a seizure or the family may have about the child having a seizure or do people know that my child has an, has epilepsy and what's going to happen well that's where the the overprotection part would come you know I just saw a girl at the hospital um, Wednesday she said <clears throat> I said what's what's going on uh, she said it's uh, my mom and I said well what's going on with your mom? Well, she won't let me do anything. So, you know, anything with a capital A, you know. So um, we have to allow kids to do things because they'll become depressed, you know, if, if they can't um, be with friends and if they can't do some of the things that uh, friends do. Of course, it's all based on the situation. If someone's having seizures quite often, you have to be realistic about that. and. Um, take accommodation for that but it's a risk you know everything's a risk all of us we're at risk every time we walk out the door we're at risk so we can't live letting fear um, tell us what to do one more comment on dealing with anxiety and stress is that as parents we all have to take care of ourselves too so, you know, eating right and sleeping right and getting exercise and all of those things that you do to keep yourself healthy are very, very important in terms of helping you deal with, with stress. Doing those things for your, with your children as well is a, is a good way to manage the stress. But you have to take care of yourself. And if you find that you're not dealing well with the stress and it's interfering with your ability to take care of your child, then you need to maybe get counseling, maybe get some help with it. So sometimes it's not easy to deal with. Do you have anything to add to that on um, the fear aspect in terms well, of being a mom with a child with epilepsy and a seizure out in public or certainly right. you've gone through that? Well, and she, Alex, um, again, there's a social component where she is very self-focused and that's a good thing and a bad thing and she never had fear about having a seizure in public just because she's just not aware too much of what other people are thinking and is anybody even looking at me. Um, but then we just have been blessed with a very low-key anything goes okay you need me to go have a second epilepsy surgery let's go now she just she's very um, matter of fact about it and it, we're not taking credit for that it's just we're fortunate that you had that combination because we've often said you know we see some other personalities of preteen girls and we're like wow would they handle it as well as alex does and we're lucky well, and I think that may speak to how you have handled it with her as well. Not necessarily. <laughs> I'm trying to give you some credit here, Susan. So, so let's move on to another, another hot topic, um, which is depression. You know, we all know that about 20, 25 to 29 percent of the kids diagnosed, children and youth with epilepsy, will have some clinical depression diagnosed. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, it can often look different in kids with epilepsy. And, and maybe Eric, you'd like you'd like to start with that, and, and maybe give us some some hints about how uh, you know what we should be looking for in the children. Okay. Well, um, the biggest difference you'd see with um, a child or an adolescent compared to an adult with depression is the symptom of irritability. You know, these are these are kids that may not want to talk, or little things bother them. They're overly sensitive. Or an adult, it might appear as just sad or more isolative. To me, I guess the question is, is the depression related to the roadblocks because of epilepsy or seizures, or is it also an effect of seizure? Mm -hmm. So there's some depressive symptoms that come after the seizure's over and it's lingering. So that's one distinction that I would make. 
Uh, if it's medical or more medical, then I guess you have to let that take its course and you work with your, your doctors. Um, if it's more situational, then you're going to have to find out what the root of the depression is. For example, the girl that I mentioned, obviously she was depressed because she wasn't able to do things that she really wanted to do. Uh, she wanted to be with her friends and she was restricted to um, only going over to relatives' house because they knew her condition. So I think those are things that you'd have to kind of tease apart in therapy. Mm -hmm. Plus, just being able to talk about it. You know, a lot of these things we don't want to talk about it every day. Uh, but in a, in counseling, you're, you're able to say some things, and they stay in the office, and you feel better just by saying them out loud. Kathy, or, do you have anything um, to add to that? Just the you know the understanding that depression is more frequent in has a higher incidence in kids with epilepsy or people with epilepsy than it does in the general population. And it's probably a combination of the, the situational kinds of things, but also the, the physio physiology of what's going on in the brain. There is a connection there so that there is a higher incidence of depression. So as parents, it's important to sort of keep an eye out for that and to be assessing your child's mood and watching for signs of depression. And again, like Eric said, irritability is the main, the main symptom that you see in kids they just get nasty and angry sometimes and sullen and don't want to do anything, um, start having academic difficulties and somatic complaints like stomach aches and can't sleep or sleeping all the time, can't eat or eating all the time. So it can be the extremes of those. So um, it's really important to watch for those, recognize that, that it is a problem with kids with epilepsy. And the other factor is, you know, almost all of the meds that we use to treat, I want to say almost, all of the meds <laughs> that we use to treat epilepsy with have this big black box warning now, you know, that there is increased suicidal thoughts with these medications. So, you know, changes in behavior and, and changes in mood when you start a new medication are important to keep an eye on as well. That, you know, sometimes it is the medicine and sometimes we have to switch the medicine because, of, because it's provoked those symptoms of depression and suicidal thoughts. So, it's really important to pay close attention to those things in your children. But primarily, primarily irritability is what you're saying parents should be, be looking for in children and youth. That's what I hear you all saying. Yeah, I, think that, yeah, I think that's the, um, sort of the main thing to look for. Um, but certainly, I mean, we don't want to just say that is the only thing to look for. Kids um, don't always uh, verbalize, right? Mm -hmm. So behavior says a lot. Um, we don't want to over uh, uh, interpret behavior, but some behaviors are pretty clear. You know, when people are unhappy, when they don't want to cooperate, when they're not willing to work with you, um, that's a sign that there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. So. And I think kids can't always verbalize their feelings very well either. So they aren't going to say, I'm depressed. You know, they're going to act it. They're going to be it. And so you, the people around them need to be able to recognize that and take some steps. And it's tough when they're on the medication. Yeah. We, yeah they, they, you're right. The black box warnings are everywhere now. Yeah. Um, what I would like to ask you all, what, what should, uh, how can we help parents select a counselor? What kind of of things should a, a parent be looking for, a family be looking for, uh, in terms of selecting a counselor to help with fear, anxiety, and depression that they're not able to handle without some additional help? Um, I'm going to leave well, that one to Eric. <laughs> okay, well, I'll start because we did have Alex work, work with a counselor last year, and I was just going to say to finish up what they had just prior. Alex has never presented with the irritability necessarily, just some teenager stuff that we can always just talk her through, but um, if anything, she's just been kind of flat. And when that didn't change coming out of elementary school, at when we were able to, to change medications, it took a very long time and got her to a good place with medication, some better control, and we didn't see that change. These behaviors continued through middle school and she kind of keeps to herself. We just needed to know as parents that that's okay for her, that she's okay with that, that this didn't just happen to her and now she didn't know what to do about it. So we um, talked with the, the uh, counselor at school and got some recommendations and it's a good process to go through to try and talk to other parents too because you'll figure out who's the right fit for your kid. And Alex was very comfortable with this woman and it, it just gave us um, 
an outlet, for, or actually gave Alex an outlet of someone to talk to other than mom and dad, because she probably would say, I talk to them enough. <laughs> They're asking me how I am way too much. And, and we just felt good after about four months of sessions with her that she was able to go through a number of topics with Alex, like friendship, how do you start a conversation, what do you do at lunch, you know, do you have any desire to do the after school stuff? And we took this woman's assessment that, you know, that's where Alex is and that's okay. That doesn't mean we're not gonna go back to it at mm -hmm. some point in the mm -hmm. future again, but that's where she is now. Um, you know, in, in picking a counselor, you know, especially for something like uh, a child with epilepsy, I, I think that is definitely a consideration. You're gonna want somebody that has experience dealing with kids with uh, chronic health problems. So that, I think mm -hmm. that helps the, the therapist to sort of sort out the difference between what's happening medically and then also mm -hmm. what's happening from the environment or just from the child's own psychological uh, issues. Um, of course, you know, word of mouth is good, so talking to somebody that's had a good experience with a therapist is, uh, is good. I think we do that well, almost with everything. If you were going to have work done at your house, you probably want someone to say, this guy was fair with me and uh, did a good job. I um, have a perspective of that you're working with a family. So it's not just the fit for the child, it's also somebody that will work with the family. I spend a lot of time with parents, even siblings, um, and I think I'm trying to help the family help the child with this situation. You, they're the therapist 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Me in one hour, I can't solve all the problems. They have to be able to use the skills that we talk about in therapy on their own. So I think um, it just takes time. You go and you try it out if it's working. If you feel comfortable, if your child says they feel comfortable, then you stick. And if it's, if it's not, you politely just ask either for another referral or you keep asking friends or people like the Epilepsy um, Society uh, for other referrals. I think this is something that I struggle with in my practice is helping kids and families connect up with somebody because it, it is really hard um, to find a person that you fit with. And it, it's also a recognition that, and Eric and I were talking about this a little bit beforehand, it's a lot of work and it's a commitment and it's not like go in and talk for 10 or 15 minutes and everything's going to be f fixed. It's like people coming to a medical doctor and I just want that pill that's going to make my kid be good, you know, and that pill doesn't exist. It's hard work and takes time and, and there has to be a commitment to do that. Um, and I always encourage patients too, you know, if they, they'll tell me, well, I had this horrible experience with this, you know, therapy that I went to before and I don't ever want to do anything like that again. And because you didn't fit with one person in the beginning doesn't mean you're not going to find somebody that you can. You do have to find somebody that you can work with and that you trust. And that may take a couple of different people, you know, going through a couple of different people to make that happen. So, and then, you know, to me, the elephant in the room is that insurance doesn't cover this stuff very well. So that's a, that's a real struggle too, is that, you know, finding, sometimes you're limited to two or three people that your insurance will pay for. Um, and so you have to pick from those, and that's sort of the reality of it, too. You, you are limited by, um, unless you can pay out of pocket, you're limited by what your insurance will cover. So, so advocate. So. <laughs> mental you, health services yeah, on your mental health insurance. Mental health services and call your insurance company, call your benefits office. Yeah. And I think another elephant in the room that we haven't touched on is what, what if you, how do you handle these kids in your clinics? when you know they need to go and see a counselor, but how are you gonna get a recalcitrant treat, a, a teen who really is gonna dig their heels in? Uh, do you have some hints for that clinically to help families? It's a tough one, I know. It is, it is. I, um, I think one of the things is to not quit trying that, um, you know, kids may be resistant in the beginning, but as, if you can at least get them to start, that it may help. Um, and to just keep trying. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I think that um, it's my experience that once kids come in, they do want to talk. So um, I've been out in, in my, especially in my private office, I've been out to the parking lot quite often. <laughs> 
talking to somebody in the back seat of mom and dad's car, just introducing myself. But um, it does work. Once, if, if you can get them in the car, even if they say they don't want to come and they're giving you a hard time, but at the same time they're putting their jacket on and they're willing to get in the car, mm -hmm. I think the behavior speaks louder than their words. Mm -hmm. And you don't give up, I think, the point of just sticking with it. Um, therapist needs to kind of go through the process with the family too to get to know the family. So things may happen in the course of treatment and all the things that happen within that week or the two weeks all becomes material to work on in the session. Mm -hmm. So someone might be coming in and things are stable and then next week certain things happen and then next week they're stable again. But that relationship's important. Uh, the, the better the relationship, the more comfortable the kid feels, the more comfortable the parents feel, the more helpful that uh, someone like me can be. Do you have anything to add? Well, just, you have to give your kids credit. They understand, I think, a lot more than we um, assume they do. And so if you just want to say, this is why we're doing it, and this is the benefit that we hope all of us will get out of it, I think they understand more than we know. Oh, I think they understand a lot more than we know. I would agree. They're very smart. Kids are smart. But to add to, I'm just yes, add no, to go that ahead. point, too, um, it's back to that overdoing it or underdoing it, right, especially with the question of therapy and if the child's going to get very upset with the idea of having to talk to somebody. If you know in your heart, just like you know that going to clinic and taking medicine and doing whatever your medical doctors say do, if you know in your heart that things are not going well, and you're about out, out of ideas, or the relationship with your child is deteriorating and you can't talk, you have to come. And you'd be, not, you'd be doing your child a disservice by allowing them not to come. And what I tell families and kids, if you're doing well, we stop. So show me that you're doing well, and you don't have to see me very often. It's in your control. And that, that I think that's important, especially for teenagers. But I think even for younger, I think even for elementary school kids, that's important. They, they all want some control. We're giving them their meds. We're making them do EEGs and MRIs. And we have to remember that they need some control. They don't, parents, we feel out of control with a child with chronic illness, but certainly that child does as well. So shifting gears a little bit, but in, but in the same theme in terms of how we, how we help our kids cope, you know, they're not able to drive as they get older, low self-esteem issues, activity restrictions, uh, the stigma associated with chronic illness, epilepsy, fear of seizures. Um, they have a hard time making friends. How, how have, do you have suggestions about how to help the families and the kids with, with just some hints about how to, how to help them become more socially engaged, keep them involved with their peers? Um. Well, you know, we, we're going to not focus on what they can't do. Good. There's the hole in the donut, and then right. there's the donut. So um, I want to know what the child's talents are. I want to know what they're good at. Because if, if we can figure that out, we can find a way to use that. And oftentimes, that will bridge a gap socially. You start going, if you're you know, good in band, it's music. If you can draw. Um, probably not going to be race car driving, right? So you pick something and then you try to encourage them with their strength to get out there. And I think that helps a lot because if you know what you're doing, you feel competent in, in a certain area, I think socially you feel a little bit better about trying. Okay, that's a great, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Um, one of the things that I see as a real barrier to being socially active is at, I was reading a study recently that asked children to sort of describe their experience with epilepsy and like the overriding symptom that they um, talked about was profound fatigue um, which is part of the disease the drugs and everything else that goes and goes along with that but if you're tired all the time and you have no energy and and that's sort of kind of go on with this um, sort of apathy that goes along with that it's hard to engage in anything so I think again you know I'm a nurse so we we'll talk about health issues but being healthy and sleep at the proper time will help with that daytime fatigue it's certainly not going to eliminate it completely but um, 
you know, I hear stories, oh, that, you know, he doesn't go to bed at night and he's up till midnight, one o'clock, doesn't fall asleep, but he's got a TV in his room and he plays video games up until the minute before he goes to bed and there's no regular bedtime and there's no regular routine in the house. So all of those things are important. So he's like, get the TV out of the room, get the video games out of the bedroom and get a routine going and get to sleep at a regular time. So if you have good nighttime sleep, it's not going to eliminate the, the the fatigue that goes along with epilepsy, but it's going to help. So then if you have some energy, then you can actually get out the door and do some things. And I think as parents, you need to have an opportunity for, give the kids opportunities to engage with other kids with some social interaction. School is certainly one place, but that's taken up with sort of set activities. But, you know, kids over to your house, having families that know about your child's epilepsy and you trust to be able to perhaps treat a seizure if it comes along, they know what the action plan is, so that the child can go to another house without you for small periods of time and sort of stretch that out, I think is important. Um, so, so giving kids those, um, those opportunities. Making your house the cool house to be at so other kids will be there. Um, I, I think that's a good thing for all parents to be so that, you know, you know where your kids are and who they're with because they're at your house. But me having good opportunities for kids to interact there. Um, if kids have difficulty with social skills, I mean, some kids just don't know how to engage with other kids. And that's a skill that needs to be learned. Um, and some kids sort of learn it naturally by being exposed to different things and some kids need a little bit extra help. And there's lots of places and social skills, workshops, and those kinds of things that kids can learn some of those skills from. Um, I think it's important that kids talk to their close friends about their epilepsy. I, you know, there's a pros and cons to disclosing, but if their close friends know about their epilepsy, then you're gonna trust that they can be with those friends a little bit more easily. Um, and their friends will be more accepting of them as well when they understand a little bit more about what epilepsy is and what it means. Um, kids, and I, encouraging the kids to talk, your child to talk about their epilepsy with other people and explain it in their own words, what it is and what it means to them. I think it's helpful too to get them to have some friends with things to do, so. You know, to add to that, you know, we're talking about anxiety and one of the major symptoms of anxiety is avoidance. You know, when you're anxious, we all want to get away from the thing that makes us feel uncomfortable. And one of the problems is you become socially anxious. Again, what if I'm in, in this place and I get sick? But there's no way to cure anxiety without being in a situation. So you can't become brave and do things without doing them. So it's in the child's best interest for parents to push a little and not accept, I don't like that, or I don't want to, or not now, maybe next year. We, wanna, we don't want to push or, or put them in a situation that they can't handle, but usually the kids can handle something, and you want to keep pushing it along that way so they can gain this confidence. We talk about social skills. You can't get social skills at home. I mean, you can practice with your family, but you need to be around your peers, and there's no substitute for exposure and time uh, to learn. So these are very important things. And if you're worried about being overprotective uh, or you're overprotective and you deny your child this, it comes at a cost. And then later on, they, they don't feel as brave to do things or they become depressed because they know they probably could do something, but they're too afraid to try. Or they don't get along as well or have the social relationships that they want because they just don't have the skills. So it's very important for parents to, to push that along. Excellent, and for parents to feel comfortable with that. Do you have anything to add um, to that, Susan? Well, for us, we know some of her limitations and some of them are probably permanent. So we've chosen to take an approach of, um, let's plan and dream together. How are we gonna do this differently then? Alex will not likely ever drive because of a permanent field cut. It's very significant. And mom's okay with that. I think, I, I think that, that's going to be a good thing because of all the attention and just so many other issues. But instead, we choose to dream, oh, where are you going to live downtown? Where, you know, you're gonna, you could go to school downtown. And you know what? Mom and dad are probably going to move down there with you because we'll move into a condo. We'll meet for dinner. And we just dream together. And we're doing that early enough so that literally she could start driver's training in January 
And we've already said, if you want to take the class portion of it, that's okay with us. If you want to experience it, and she's kind of like, why would I do that? But she may change her mind. So we're just working through it step by step, but also looking far enough ahead so that we can kind of start framing things for her and model that. How do you model that for her so she can t start doing that herself? And just another little thing, she, she really likes to sing. School choir didn't work, so she does church choir. The school choir just didn't fit schedule-wise with her special ed classes, and there's some real ability issues there. That So she does the church choir and loves it. There's ways around things. Yeah, ways to accommodate mm -hmm. if you know your child and you're willing to to do that work. And it's hard work. This is hard work. This is, this is not easy. Yeah. Um, another topic that comes up often is concerns about safety from parents. And I, I want to touch on that too parents, other adults, caregivers, to be overprotective of the children with epilepsy. Um, overprotectiveness, I think, with any child with a chronic illness. How, how can we help parents balance the need for safety with the child's need to grow and have some independence and try new things? I know you, you've, we've all touched on that, but do you have any other, any other hints for the families in terms of balance? And I think trying. I, you know, it's that even kids Parents of kids who don't have chronic illnesses bite their tongues a lot as they let their kids do things that they're terrified to let them do. And it's even more of a significant issue when your kid has an issue or a, you know a, whatever their chronic health is, problem is, but um, be it epilepsy or something else. But I had an experience once with them, or just a few weeks ago with a mom that I know well whose daughter's about four years old now. And um, the school, the school took a trip to an amusement park, and she was terrified to let her go, but she went along. And then the teacher said, you know, no, let her go on this ride. It was a twirly ride thing, not a up in the air ride, but a twirly ride. And she finally, the teachers talked her into letting her daughter on this ride, and she loved it. I mean, and it, so her mom stood back and was like, okay, I guess I can do this. You know, and she had a good time. So sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and let them do it. But you have to have that plan, too. And I think, you know, knowing what you're going to do if something goes wrong, the child knows what to do if something goes wrong, the people around them, if they, you know, know what to do if they have a seizure, especially if their seizures are very intractable and frequent. So, it, you know, it's different with a child who has a seizure once every two years as a patient, a child who has five mm -hmm. seizures a day or ten seizures a day. So it is definitely different. But I think it's so important to not overprotect because that really does tell the child that they're not capable um, uh, and they aren't going to learn how to do things if they don't have an opportunity to experience them. Um, you know, the, especially as the, the children are getting older, it's um, independence is, is the issue. They, it's natural to want to become more independent and I think that's the struggle that parents have with all kids is, you know, uh, independence versus dependence, uh, allowing kids to do things um, when you're afraid that they could get hurt. Um, but this is going to happen. I mean, kids are going to want to be independent. And we need to encourage independence because parents are not always going to be there to protect. So we want to give our kids as much um, skills as possible uh, so they're ready in case something does happen. Um, the conflict that can come up though is between this overprotectiveness or maybe even a child's assumption that they can do more than they can really do. And if you have a positive relationship with your child, you can negotiate that. You can allow them to do something, but it's in steps. You know, you, you're going to get out there on the bike with the training wheels, and then you do well on that, and then we'll talk about taking them off. But it's, they can see their progress, you can see their progress, and you just continue to push it forward uh, so they feel independent. Um, if they don't, then it'll be something, you know, what they call hostile dependency. You'll do it for them, but they're going to be angry about mm -hmm. it. And then here you are giving everything to your child, and then you're feeling like they don't appreciate you. But what's underneath that is, they, I bet they do appreciate you, but they also know that they need some choices, they need to do some things on their own, and we need to help them do that. 
Well, and it's just part of that is acknowledging sometimes that their needs are far greater than ours. That, you know, we may feel this need to keep control and, and to know that everything's going to be okay, but their need for that independence is greater than whatever we're feeling right now. And to be proactive about it, to, to say, okay, now's the time. We're going to leave them home alone for two hours. And we're going to set it up and structure it and practice some things and then just keep doing that, creating the opportunities where you can reinforce the positive things and work through the bad things to give them the success that they want with their independence. And, and you know, just like you did with driving, you can get out ahead of these things. They're not, some of these things are not very mysterious. You know, the kid's going to want a cell phone at some point, or they're going to want to drive, or they're going to want to go sleep over at a friend's house. We need to think ahead and start mm -hmm. talking about it and start talking about uh, how to make that happen, or and if there are some things that you can't make happen, then you have to be very clear with the answer of no. I'm sorry, it can't happen. Let's deal with that. We're not going to promise things that just can't happen. I think that just sets up for fights. But yeah, to get out ahead of it and talk about it and work with your child. I think to also be realistic about um, restrictions. The most injuries happen to people with epilepsy in driving and swimming. Um, so, you know, obviously if someone has uncontrolled or poorly controlled seizures, they shouldn't be driving. Or, and then they shouldn't be swimming without some really close supervision. So, you know, those are two restrictions that, I mean, when I fill out school forms, those are on there. You know, but, um, so to be realistic, and, and other things may be less unsafe, and so there are things that you can sort of take that chance and probably let your child try those up, try those experiences. So, so you're, you're really what you're. I think what we're talking about that was the the next uh, the next section talking about transition. I I call it transitioning, um, where you're moving from where you're really in in control of them. They're little. And you're advocating, as that's what I hear you're saying, you're advocating little by little by little, starting as early as you can in terms of allowing them some independence, in terms of, of what they're doing, which is scary for parents. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself supporting parents sometimes more in that than the kids, Eric, in terms of independence and, and transition? Well, um, you know, everybody needs that support. This is pretty scary. And um, the support goes both ways. It goes to the parents, it goes to the kids. And I was just thinking, the responsibility of epilepsy, whose condition is it, right? And do we start early with, you know, again, we go back to where we started, coming to terms with the fact. You know, kids don't like the fact. Parents become the uh, controls of the fact, you know, we'll be the ones that tell you that you have to take your medicine and we'll tell you what not to do, but the kids need to learn how to take care of themselves. And that starts at a young age, at, at whatever age appropriate level. Um, I have some teenagers that take their own medication, you know, they'll help setting it out, but it's their responsibility to take it. And I think that sets up for later in life to be responsible for yourself to go into the doctors and not just talk for your child, let them be able to explain to the doctor, to the nurse, how they're feeling and what's been going on. And you can add your, your opinion too, but not sit there and, and, and take over. Mm -hmm. I don't think that gets them ready. Well, part of the, the transition that we do, it again, it's been a long-term thing with us. We've been able to tell her all along, look at the amazing things that you have accomplished. You, you know, you have been taking medication your entire life. Her brother can't. He's 11. So, I mean, just even little things like that, that Alex says, yes, I'm a capable person. And in the, the planning that goes into, like I said, the transition to middle school and the independence there, we made a really big deal out of that because coming out of a, a categorical room, mainstreamed part of the time, she just plunged right in and was just only getting resource, resource room support. So you do take all those opportunities to say, yes, you are a very capable person. And you know what? Your epilepsy has made a lot of this possible for you. You got to experience things that other kiddos didn't. You had to go about things a different way sometimes and work a little bit harder. But it's made you who you are. And we talk about that quite a lot. Excellent. I think also that, that 
Remembering that the epilepsy is a small part of the child, that it's a child with epilepsy, not an epileptic child. I, I feel very strongly that language and how you say things is very important. So um, I think that's important too, is that this is one small piece of this child and there's lots of positives and lots of strengths and sort of building on those is mm -hmm. very important. Um, and it, it, sort of building on what Eric was saying, I, it really is a process when kids start to take independence for their own um, care, their own self-care, and I think starting with the, with the safer, easier things like having them understand that eating right and sleeping right is important to their epilepsy control so that they take control of those parts first and that there be structure and routines that they can start to take part of. And part of that is the medication. And I know that's always the scary part for parents, at least what they tell me, is allowing the child to be responsible to take the medication. And um, you need to make sure they're ready for that. Not, you know, some kids with epilepsy are uh, cognitively behind and maturity-wise behind their peers. So at an age when another child may be able to remember to take their, say, their insulin for their diabetes, your child with epilepsy may not be quite there yet. But to sort of gradually allow them to assume that responsibility. And I really do feel strongly about this. Um, when you come into the, to the neurologist's office or the provider's office, that the child be able to talk about for themselves. And we as pediatric providers don't do that really well all the time because <laughs> we're so used to talking to the parent and um, it, it's hard sometimes to make that shift to talk to the child. So sometimes you guys have to remind us of that as well, that um, you know he's going to tell you about his seizures so and how they feel and how they've been and you know do they come in and know what their meds are I you know we don't have very many kids who are able even 17 18 19 year olds who can come in and tell me what their meds are and what their dosages are which they should be able to do by that time by by teenage years um, so just allowing them to start assuming some of that responsibility and then giving them lots of positive reinforcement when they do do it so it's not just negative yelling when they don't remember, but it's the positive reinforcement when they do remember and do things. Excellent points. Well, we're, get, we're getting a little bit near the end of time, but I, I want to give, I want to have something specifically for Susan and then something for Eric and, and Kathy. Uh, Susan, I, I think, can you identify one or two things that you, you would say are the most important thing that parents of children or youth with epilepsy um, can do to foster the sense of well-being and, and some... Uh... Well, we've all talked um, today about the unpredictability and how you know, the, the medications have an impact. It's just really to dig in and try and understand who, who your child is. In our case, we didn't have a 10-year you know, period and then epilepsy became part of their life. So we've always said, you know, who would Alex be underneath these these layers? And we get, we think we we are getting to know that because you try things and it doesn't seem to be a good fit for her. Mm -hmm. um, like cross country, we made her do cross country. <laughs> she's not there. She's not sure she wants to do golf. But just our job as parents is always to be trying things with our kids, but then not to be projecting what we want for her, but truly, Alex, what do you want? And start that conversation and have her think about it. Um, she knows what her limitations are probably better than we do. We can get a neuropsych test done and read it, but I think in a lot of ways they have a better sense than any test does. And just give them the opportunities, support them, in those opportunities, but then be accepting when they say, you know, this isn't me, or I don't even want to try that. We've had to learn to, okay, really listen to her. That's great. Yeah. And so, Eric and, and Kathy, in conclusion, what do you have any 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 last thoughts before we open a little bit to questions about about what uh, important things parents of children and youth with epilepsy can do to maintain and enhance, in addition to what you've said already. Well, I, I would just end by saying that uh, the parents are the models. So if you're doing well, if you're taking care of yourself, um, then, you know, I think it makes the situation a lot easier. Uh, the kids are looking to you guys, um, f you know, for how to be social, also how to take care of yourself emotionally. So. The, the better you are at taking care of yourself, I think the benefits go on to your children. Kathy, 
Kathy, do you have any last so, comments? Yeah, I think, um, you know, characteristics that I see in families who are successful in all this, I think Susan is, is one of those examples. And mm -hmm. I, the, the, the being able to see your child, and it's your child, and she happens to have this epilepsy, but it's your child, and um, understanding the epilepsy and being understanding what you can control and then doing what you need to do to control that, but also understanding what you can't control and being able to let it go. Just, you know, I can't control that, so I'm not going to spend time worrying about it. Um, when I've worked with families kind of through the process of my, you know, my child's having a lot of seizures and they are, um, it's, un, un, you know, uncontrolled and I can't figure it out and I'm learning and everything else. And it's like they go through this process and then there's a new reality. And it may not be the same reality as you had for your child from the, when they were born. You have this vision of what your child is going to be. There's a new reality and it's still, it's good. It's different, but it's good, and it's being able to kind of get there and understand that this is the new reality, and it's what's the child's strengths and what's this child going to be capable of doing. So, Thank you. Wonderful thoughts. Thank you all for your great comments. We have, I think, just a few minutes for questions. If anyone has questions for any of the panelists. No? Cindy has a microphone if anyone has a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Especially after lunch. Thank you for attending the session.